Right, welcome back. Okay, let's pick up from this point for our peace. Right? So we looked at, but he was wounded, he was pierced for our transgressions, for our sins, and he was bruised for our iniquities, that is, our evils, our faults, our guilt. The chastisement, that means the punishment for our peace. Now, the word peace here is shalom, and I'm sure you've heard this word before. The Greek word for shalom is a comprehensive word. It's a big word. But to simplify it, we can say shalom means well-being in our spirit, soul, and body. Right? So well-being in our spirit, in our mind, in our soul, in our body. Right? So when Jesus says shalom, he's saying not only peace, He's not saying it's only peace that, you know, in the trouble, I'll give you peace. No, he's saying you will have healing in your body, healing in your mind, healing in your soul. You know, we can have a very strong physical body, but if we are hurt and wounded in the mind, in our soul, it can dry us out. Right? So here he's talking about complete wholeness. Complete well-being, right? How do we know this? Because when we look at scriptures, we see that Jesus healed people who were afflicted in the spirit, demonized people, people who were demon-possessed. He healed them. Remember that boy whose mother came crying and said, please pray for my son because he's possessed. He jumps into the fire. We tried to save him so many times. No, he, he jumps into the fire. There's no peace in the family. Imagine that poor mom, mother. And Jesus says, be gone from him. He drives out the demons away. And there was peace in that family. Imagine Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter is dead. You think everyone was celebrating? No. They were broken. They were, there was no peace. There was sadness. Jesus rose them up. Rose up. Jairus' daughter. He's come so that you and I can walk in physical wholeness, mental wholeness, emotional wholeness, spiritual wholeness. Complete well-being is what he's offering us. Right? So if you see the scriptures, right, there are many examples. Multitudes who touch Jesus, the lunatic boy, the man with uh, dropsy, the ten lepers, the man at the pool of Bethsaida, the crippled man in Acts 3. Uh, the Roman centurion, the woman with the issue of bleeding, and plenty of other miracles. God, the Lord Jesus, brought shalom upon their life. So it's not only healing. Shalom is total wholeness. Right? Then he says in 53 verse 6, And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all look at this the lord isaiah is writing okay always remember this should be in your background who's writing isaiah has he seen sheep and shepherds yes but now he's writing about a person who he has not seen he's writing about a cross which he doesn't even know about but he's trying to bring figurative language just like how sheep go astray, we all go, are going astray. So since we go astray, what does it say? The Lord God himself laid upon this person, right? laid upon him the iniquity of, of us all. The word laid has two a twofold meaning. Number one, the word laid in, in the Hebrew paga means to, to lay upon or to dump upon somebody. How many of you did this in school? Your teacher gives you homework. Oh, man. And then you got one subject which you don't like at all. You don't like it because you don't know it. You don't know anything in that subject. What do you do? Take that book, you'll go give it to your father or your mother. And you do it. But you have to learn. No, I don't. You do it. I remember as a little boy, my mother's tongue is Kannada, but I don't know Kannada. 
My mother is a Kannada teacher. For 40 years, she is a Kannada teacher. So now what did I do? When I started growing up, when I was fourth, fifth standard, I don't know how to read Kannada. So my mother would read Kannada and explain the story to me. Because I don't know how to read. So what would I do? Any homework and all? Go straight to my mother, dump it on my mother. I know the homework is going to get done. Did I understand anything? Zero. How will you write your final exam? That we'll see later. You teach me, I'll go write it. No problem. I can write. But reading, I couldn't read. It was just too difficult. But I would dump all the homework. And I know that she'll do it. It was laid on her. She knows that this boy will come and give me the Kannada homework and she will sit and write it. The teacher also knows that it is not me who's written it because it's too correct. Everything is correct. She knows. What is happening here? I have dumped everything upon my mother. So I'm not worried about Kannada. I'm worried about science, English, social studies. Okay, those are. I have no excuse for that. My mother will say, you know English, you study yourself and do it. You are okay, you don't know. I dump it on her. You get the understanding here? I, I've dumped everything. So God dumped upon Jesus, put everything. What is an iniquity? An iniquity is a sin that you know is a sin while you're committing the sin. And yet God forgives that. Let me give you an example. Become a believer. Like you've come out of example, a, a boy or a, a person is, was an alcoholic, but God changed his life and now he's become a believer. He knows that he's the temple of the Holy Spirit. He has to live a holy life. But some challenges happen in his workplace or he is very worried and he's tempted to have a little drink. So he goes, he's struggling within himself. Oh, I should not do this. This is wrong. But there's this fight inside and he's going, he goes to the shop, he buys the liquor bottle and he comes home and he keeps telling himself, no, this is wrong. I should not do this. I know it's wrong. I should not do this. But this pressure in my mind, this work, that is such a big tension and the problems that I'm not able to, but there's a fight inside. And then he goes and gets a glass. And then he says, no, this is wrong. I don't want to do this. I know it's a sin. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He opens the bottle. I keep saying, no, I should not do this. God has blessed me with a wife and a, a beautiful children. Why would I want to throw myself into this again? And he pours the drink. And he's committing the sin. He's committing the sin. He knows it's a sin. He knows he's committing that sin. And that is called an iniquity. Even that sin... He, knowing it's a sin, Jesus has already forgiven them. How do you differentiate between sin and iniquity? Yeah, so an iniquity, uh, as I was explaining, an iniquity is it's a sin that you know it's a sin, but I'm still doing it. Right? I know it's wrong. See, sometimes we sin unknowingly. Right? Oh, uh, we say something. You know, unforgiveness, anger. Iniquity is something that is, you know, it's wrong. But I purposely do it. Uh, that is the iniquity. And, and, and even that sin, Jesus has taken it up. But it's not like automatically that sin gets forgiven. We have to go back. Even at that moment, right? If we go back to Jesus and say, just throw away the... Just this example of this man, he takes the bottle, he throws it out of his house and he just says, never going to do this again. This is the wrong thing that I have done. But he runs back to the cross. He says, Jesus, I've done this wrong. Jesus will forgive him. Jesus is not going to say, oh, you know everything. I got you out of this five years back. What made you? I, the Holy Spirit is inside you. What made you do this? He's not going to do all of that. He's going to forgive. But the Holy Spirit is always there to correct us, to exhort us. That's what iniquity is, where he has, he has laid on himself all of that. The sins, knowingly, unknowingly. So there's something called as sins of commission and sins of omission. 
right? And, but we'll not go into that. We'll talk about that later, right? So there's two fold purpose. One is to dump, and the second idea is make intercession. Right? So he has laid means to dump, and now after dumping it. Now, many times my mother has come for the parent teacher meeting. How come his homework is all done correctly, but in the exam he's not written anything? My mother is making intercession now. I wrote it. See, you should not write it because he won't learn anything. No, I will teach him. I know because he's not able to understand how to read Kannada. But I will correct him. I will teach him. Give him some time. He needs to understand that. But he knows how to write. He'll do well. So if you ask, if you tell him the story, he will write it. What is my mother doing? He's, she's making intercession for me. First of all, I dumped all the Kannada on her. Two, he's making intercession during parent teacher meeting. Okay, give him some time. Now, after that, my mother didn't say, okay, go enjoy and then, you know, I'll keep doing. No, no. She made me to sit and learn it. I put the effort and learn how to read Kannada. So she went back to first standard, teaching me all of those things. I had to learn it. Eventually, I had to get to read because I knew, you know, I was what, in fourth grade or fifth grade. I knew that this is going to be that little 10th standard. I cannot escape it. Yeah, I had to learn. But she made intercession for me. That is what it means to lead upon one stumped on Jesus, two, and now Jesus is a mediator between God and man. As one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Right? Next one, as a sheep before its shearers. 53, Isaiah 53 and verse 7. Everyone with me? Yes? Okay, let's read verse 7. Read it from your notes. He was oppressed mm. and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers in silence. Mm. So he opened not his mouth. He was oppressed. Have you seen the, the cattle in uh, plowing the field? Do you think the ox like it? They like to be free, right? They like to be moving around. You know, eating grass, enjoying themselves. But Jesus, that when that oppression, that weight is on him, on that ox, it's oppressed. And now you see ox, they're continually oppressed. They are bent. Normally they are bent. Why? Because for hours and hours that yoke is upon them. They go up, the, they do the plowing the whole day. At least five to six hours a day, the hot sun, and it's oppressed the whole time. If you've noticed, you know, the neck is always down. Why? Right? It's an oppression. Like, an, like, you know, painfully abused or distressed. Jesus was oppressed. And he was afflicted. He had to, he was, he, he was dealt out, he was looked down upon, he was treated badly. To afflict is to cause injury, to cause pain. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. You know that verse, the psalmist says, Psalms 34, He delivered me from my afflictions, from my troubles, right? Yet, He opened not His mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Look at the picture Isaiah is giving. He opened not His mouth. How did Isaiah know He won't speak? Of the Holy Spirit. Pilate is asking Jesus, Are you who everyone say you are? No answer. Are you, well, you don't want to defend yourself? No answer. He didn't open his mouth. Tell me, are you the son of, son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, who everyone are talking about? Because you're saying so, you believe it. I am that. He didn't talk unnecessarily. Do you think Jesus could not have wiped them out? No time. But he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. When you take a lamb to the slaughter, you don't see them struggling. Very quiet. They don't even know. 
you know when abraham would have taken that lamb from the stuck in the tickets he would have put it on that it would have struggled a little bit that's it lambs by nature are very quiet very yeah they they don't they don't cause too much of a problem now you see these chickens and all you catch them they start flying everywhere it's not like that lambs are very different they are very timid creatures right and the sheep and as a sheep before its shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth the prophecy written he will not open his mouth he didn't do it he didn't speak look at the next point from prison and from judgment 53 was 8 he was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation and who will declare his generation for he was cut off from the land of living for the transgression of my people he was stricken look at that from prison to judgment jesus was held in prison overnight remember that they held him in prison so if you, you know what happened he was somewhere in the afternoon they caught jesus they brought him to the high priest on the previous night they the judas betrayed uh, uh, jesus and jesus was taken in the night right they put him into prison then he was no they they questioned him all of it and they put him into prison and the next day he was beaten the 30 40 minus 1 lashing happened by afternoon he was crucified life gone like this the same man who raised lazarus from the dead who cleansed the lepers there was no medicine for leprosy the same man who just said things and life came into people he said jairus his daughter is sleeping don't worry lifted him up lifted her up the same man who said to the storms be still The, the, the disciples are wondering, who is this man who's been commanding the seas to be still? The same man who walked on the waters. The same man who took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed thousands of people. Same man is now here before Pilate, standing. He doesn't open his mouth. Keeps his mouth shut. he could have walked out of there but he did it for you and right with the wicked and with the rich 53 and verse 9 and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth his he made his grave with the wicked meaning who 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 were there next to him when he died not any righteous people There were two thieves next to him and i believe that they would have had more compassion on the thieves than jesus the thieves are better than jesus they would have felt that way but with the rich at the death meaning joseph of arimathea was a rich man who went and asked for jesus's body he had his own tomb the reason we know he is rich is because he had his own tomb and only rich people could afford that and he had his own tomb and his body was given to joseph of arimathea and then it says nor was any deceit in his mouth there was no lie there was no deceit if if jesus had opened his mouth and said okay pilate you're saying this okay these people are saying crucify me tell me what is the fault if jesus had asked on what ground are you crucifying me could jesus have asked that yes on what ground as a jew tell me on what ground do you want to crucify me no you started a uh, preaching you started that's okay so what if i start preaching many people preach i'm not saying anything wrong i'm saying what i believe in tell me on what ground are you crucifying me pilot would have said let him go I can't crucify him. You would have said no. Why? Because there's nothing. There's no fault in him. You understand what I'm saying, right? 
But Jesus didn't defy him. He didn't stand there and try to defend himself. Because he knew he had to go through it. If Jesus had a lawyer, right, a Jewish lawyer, the Jewish lawyer would have made sure Jesus was set free. It would have happened in one hour. One hour, okay, come. Barabbas, you stand here. Jesus, you stand here. The lawyer would have said, stood there and said, okay, this is the number one criminal who's done so many things wrong. Now, pull out the papers. What did Jesus do? He healed the blind. He cleansed the lepers. He provided for people. He blessed people. He did all good things. How can you crucify him? The lawyer will say, yeah, Barabbas, you only go, you're crucified. That's what would have happened if he had defended himself. Then the whole purpose of the cross is gone. That's why he had he was silent. He was silent so that they could do what they had to do to him. Remember what the apostle Paul did? He was a Roman citizen. They said, well, we'll arrest Paul. And what did he say? Hey, I'm a Roman citizen. Oh, let him go. He paid, I paid a price for my Roman citizenship. Let him go. Same thing. I paid a price. I pay, I'm a Jewish citizen. I can I can go and I can talk in the uh, in the temple. You're saying I'm learned, you're giving me an opportunity, I'm sharing. That's nothing. Okay, I say something wrong, but you can't put me to death for that. Put me into prison for three, two years and leave me after two years. Jesus could have done that. He says here, he was quiet because they knew that he knew that this had to happen. There was no fault in him at all. That's uh, fulfilling scriptures. He shall see his seed and prolong his days. Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him into grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall be his seed. His, he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in the land. Uh, this is like a literal fulfillment and a figurative fulfillment. Okay, uh, So it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You know, once you become a parent, will you please, will you feel pleased to bruise your son and your daughter? Impossible. But for God the Father, He looked at you and me. And He looked at the end picture. That after the cross, you and I will be saved through the blood of my Son. So for that, it pleases me to put judgment upon my Son. It pleases me. I'm, I'm happy to do it. What's good? Now, God the Father is not in a place saying, okay, anyway, it's not me. No. no. He's the compassionate, loving God. If He's loving, how, will he, how would He have felt putting all the sins of the world upon His Son? It pleased Him. Why? Because of you and me. Because of us. He saw us. He said, Jesus, my Son, if you do this, the entire generations, the world will be saved by what you do. That's why the book of Hebrews says that at the name of Jesus, God exalted him higher because of what he did and seated him at the right hand of the Father. That at the name of Jesus, all power, all dominion belongs to Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he alone is God. See what happens? Right? The literal fulfillment was he he arose to see his descendants right he did everything the lord had planned everything that was uh, needed for an offering of sin when you talk about the sin offering he completed it all right and the figurative fulfillment was life came because of his offering himself right meaning uh, he brought life for people who are lost right and he shall justify many, Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his foreknowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Look at this word. Isaiah is saying, talking about justified. 
justification would have not even been a word during that time. But he's talking in terms of a literal, you know, like probably he's thinking about a, a court case. He's saying Jesus will justify you. He will justify many through the blood. And now we use the word justification. What is it? Just as if we have not sinned. Look at this. He shall see the labor of his soul. He shall see the fruit of his work. Do you think when Jesus sees his hands pierced, and if Jesus looks at his body with all those bruises, do you think Jesus is feeling sad? Is he feeling sad right now? He's saying, oh God, I went through this. Oh Lord, I went, Father, you made me go through this. No. He's saying here, he shall see the labor of his soul and he'll be pleased. He'll be satisfied. I thank you that I, I, I'm so grateful that I did this. But now that the enemy is destroyed because of one work that was done, the cross, the entire human race has been saved. And the devil has been destroyed because of one work on the cross. And you will see the labor. Do you think, you know, when God, when the Lord Jesus sees, maybe you, look, you think of a criminal who has killed many people, right? And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he changes his life and he becomes a believer. He says, oh, the cross took all my sins. Do you know how Jesus would feel? Can you think of that? Oh. If there will be rejoicing, even if one person comes into the kingdom of God. That's what the scriptures say. But Jesus will say, wow, this person was a sinner who has been a murderer. And the devil has used him. So he's murdered many people. But now he's come to the cross. Now he's righteous in my presence. The devil has no say. Look at that. He's justified us. So this sinner who's killed, murdered 10 people can come and say, I didn't murder anyone. Who murdered? I'm not sure. I, I may have, but now I'm washed. It's just as if I'm not sinned. That's what you think. No, that's what the Bible says. Now, the consequences may be, this person may be there in jail for the rest of his life. But when he goes to heaven, he'll be rejoicing in heaven. Jesus is not going to go back and Look at the back of his life and say, this is, these are the things you did. No, no, no. He's going to look at him as saved by the blood of Jesus. He'll be satisfied with the work that he has done. What a powerful work the Lord Jesus has done. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, 7 through 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Remember, you see that? If Jesus had come down from the heavens all of a sudden in a golden robe and a white horse and said, I am the Messiah and I've come to destroy the Roman government. Do you think they would have said crucify him? They would have said, please come. God made one golden chair and made him sat, sit there. But that's not the point. The point was sins had to be dealt with. Satan had to be destroyed. By sitting on the throne, you no know, Satan is going to be destroyed. So Jesus had to come this way. The cross had to happen. The next second coming, when we read in the book of Revelations, oh, he's not coming as a lamb. He's not coming as a lamb. The Bible says in Revelations, he's coming as the king of glory. It says here, ancient of days, on his right hand. King of kings. That's how he's going to come. He's not coming like a, you know, like a small thirty-year-old uh, man, a carpenter's son. Everyone can spit on him. No, he's coming as a king. The Bible says he will blow, and he will destroy the armies who comes against Israel. He will just blow. He, he's coming as a glorious king. But the Jews expected that in the first. 
then who will fulfill all the sin offering, guilt offering, pain offering, all those offerings? Jesus only, no. But now he's not coming as a lamb, he's coming as a lion. A portion with the great. Therefore, Isaiah 53, 12, therefore, therefore, because he has done all this, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. The word spoil means the plunder. So when armies go and fight with, you know, when countries and cities go and fight with other places in, in, in the Old Testament and in history, whatever was good in that country, they would bring it and come. That's called the spoils of that country, whatever, the crops or livestock, they bring it and come. So here, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death. And he, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, picture this. Jesus went into the field, into the territory of the devil. He destroyed the devil, and he brought the spoils, meaning the plunder. And he, what did he do? He divided it to his people. So imagine we are in Jesus' team. He destroyed the devil and he's giving us the spoils of the kingdom. Right? And it says here, in, we read this verse, Colossians 2.14, Christ triumphed on the cross and entered into a place of honor at the right hand of the Father, exalted over all powers. Right now, you and I are seated with Jesus in heavenly places. You may not feel so. You may be feeling sleepy and cold in Kotunur, Bangalore. But in the spiritual realms, you are seated in heavenly places. That's where you are. How do I understand it? Think about this. Jesus is standing there in the heavenly places. He's put one small chair for you. I'm just drawing a picture for you, right? I'm painting a picture. You imagine this. Jesus is standing here. All authority, all glory, fully man, fully God. Nobody can come against him, right? And then he put one small chair, and you're sitting there. And you're, have you done that? You know, your parents, you have. If you have little children, they'll be standing here. They'll keep pulling your pants. Dad, I want this. I want you take your. You know, if you once you become a parent, you take your children to the mall. Oh, every now and then this. This will come. Can I get ice cream? Can I go on the train ride? Can I get KFC? Everything in one day. Why? Father, no. Or mother, whatever. Can I get it? So you are seated with Jesus. All you have to do is Jesus. Here's my problem. Can you help me? Yes, I'll help you. Now, as a father, if my son keeps asking for, uh, you know, 10 chocolates, will I give him? I'll say, no, sit quietly. At the right time, I'll give you one. So at the right time, God knows what to give, how to give, when to give. You understand? But you're seated with him. He's given you authority. Just because he asks for 10 chocolates doesn't mean he's not my son. Just because I don't give him 10 chocolates doesn't mean I'm not his father. I'm his father. But he knows what to do. Same way. The spiritual. You are seated with Jesus. He has given you all the authority. He said you use this authority. This is the victory of the one John. I forget the verse. John writes and he says, this is the victory in the world. This is the victory of even our faith. Faith is the victory. Right? There's plenty of verses that the word of God is speaking to us through. We use it. We're seated with him. Father, you said this. Jesus, you said this. You said you've given us authority. So I'm using this authority. You said it. We use it. It's, it's like Jesus is speaking on our behalf. When the devil sees you and me, he's seeing Jesus in us. 
He's coming against Jesus. Okay? Because the Spirit of the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of Jesus. And when we know that Jesus is in us, the devil can see through it. He knows. So he will try to attack where? In the mind. Jesus is there. When the devil attacked Jesus himself, tried to tempt Jesus, will he not tempt us? It's all here. But the just shall live by faith. We don't visit faith. Every two months we go visit faith and come back. No. The just shall live by faith. It's hard. I know it's hard. But that's a promise that God has given us, right? Then he says, a portion with it. Okay, that's done. And then we see that Jesus, uh, after triumphing over us, he intercedes for us on the cross. He still, you know, on the cross, what did Jesus do? He interceded for the people. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Interceding for them. What is Jesus doing now? He's interceding for you and me. That's what he's doing now. We talked about this in Hebrews. And then we see the uniqueness of Christ. Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. He always lives to make it. He's able to save to the uttermost. It could be a person who is a complete atheist, who doesn't believe in anything about God. He's able to save them. God is able to do it. Nobody is out of the grace of God. Nobody in this world. There is no sin that the cross cannot cover. There is no sickness that the cross of Jesus Christ cannot cover. Not, nothing. No, no sin. It's all paid for. So if we go back to the cross and ask for forgiveness, we will find forgiveness. Amen? Right. So we need to accept it and believe it in our life. Chapter 17, we'll not go into the verses, but chapter 17 is where Jesus, he talks about the cross. Jesus knew he came for the cross. And all these verses, Luke 2, 34, 35, all of these verses, John 17, 1, most of the time, you know, in the, in the times of greatest victory, where Jesus was sure his power, his authority. Few, probably a few days later, he says, one day I'm going to die. I think of the disciples. Suddenly they're up there. Hey, I'm walking with Jesus. There are 5,000 people, but these 12 are the main. So I'm first in command. Then you got Peter, James, and they're all thinking, oh man, this is going to be good. But Jesus is saying, hey, one day I will die. One day I'll be put to death. Not one day, other. I'll be put to death. And one day you all will go through this kind of persecution. They are wondering why. This is nice, no? Go to one city, do one ten miracles. Go to another city, do another ten miracles. Thousands are following. Why you want to die? But Jesus foretells. He says, no. I've come not to put a show here. I've come for the cross. I have one purpose, one goal, one mission. And that is why on the cross, Jesus said, Tetelestai, that mission that I was born for in this world as a man has been finished. That's why he says it is finished. I've completed what the Father asked me to do. He foretells the cross. Do you think the disciples would have felt good? Let me read it, right? All through. There's great victory. Jesus says, prepare. I'm going, to, I'm going to be put to death. They're going to catch the Son of Man. They're going to torture him. They're going to put him to death. Don't worry, he will rise again. Everything he's told. I, I don't understand. You know, Think of this. Jesus is in the Last Supper. He's saying, the person who I dip the bread and I hand it to is the one who will betray me. But they're all busy, the disciples. Who oh, is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Jesus dips the bread and gives it to Judas. 
they didn't really they didn't notice it yes or no it's like this if i take this take a pen and i say next semester joseph is going to be the captain of the class i take the pen no i'll say next semester the person i give this pen to is going to be the captain of the class now you're all, all who's who's the next captain of the class i go and give it to joseph but you'll all have missed it and then the bible says jesus tells judas go do what you have to do but the disciples thought because he's the treasurer he has all the money right so maybe go buy the food or go do what you have to do jesus knew he tipped it he, he told them it's straightforward jesus is not hiding anything there it is very simple he says that the person who i tip this bread and i give it to is the person who's going to betray me and that is what happened he tipped it gave it to judas Judas took it, but they are still deciding, talking about who who's going to deny. And then Jesus tells Judas also, "Go do what you have to do." They still didn't get it. Right. So everywhere Jesus foretells the cross. Remember, Jesus says, "I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end." Revelations, he says, "I am the first and the last. I was dead, but now I am alive." he says jesus knew what he did he knew what he's going to do even now you and i may be in a situation he knows what he's going to do it's not like he doesn't know he knows he knows why he brought you to a situation he knows how to bring you through the situation he knows how to take you in the storm and how to bring you out of the storm also he knows it right and we got to trust in him Right, so we'll stop here. Next class, we'll get into chapter 18, and we'll try to complete chapter 18 and 19. Right, uh, we'll look at uh, the aspects of the wisdom of the cross. Now, uh, quite a few of these pointers may be a repeat of what we did in uh, lifestyle evangelism. So we'll go a little quick, uh, chapter 18 and 19, and then we can. Uh, chapter 19, again, the power and the blessings of the cross. Uh, small chapter, we can look at that. And then chapter 20 is from the cross to the throne. So this is a very interesting chapter, talking about how Jesus, what he did after Jesus died, after the cross, and how he ascended to the Father. Right? Okay, so thank you so much. Any questions, any thoughts before we close? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend and I'll see you next Friday. God bless you all.